Hello, friends. So we are going to be picking up right back up with the Diary of Anne Frank, the play. And last video consisted of Act 2, Scene 1. This time, we are going to be reading Act 1, Scene 2. So we're doing the flip-flop-a-doodle. Um, and I'm going to do this because... <clears throat> It's kind of fun to do a flashback within a flashback play. Because <laughs> that's basically what we've got in this docudrama. So the scene that we're going to be picking up with is the family has just realized that they're going to have to go into hiding. Right? The Franks, the Van Dams, or the Van Dens. Um, and Anne kind of bonds with the younger kids, but particularly a character named Peter. And so I'm going to read the director directive right before we get Anne's voice is the character that has some dialogue. And they use this as a very cool theatrical element within the play. Um, if you think about, the, that's the cool thing about theater, and I said this in the last video, is you get to experience the story in a way you might not have normally gotten to view it with certain lens. For example, in this one, um, with Anne's voice, you get to have be watching kind of like a TV screen, watching this play kind of live, and then out of nowhere you hear kind of, voice or stream of conscious of Anne, I should say, right? That inner dialogue happening when one is sitting at their table writing like, oh, this is the day, weather is cloudy. Like all the thoughts that one has when they are, you know, scribing away in their diary, we are all as an audience getting that. And so it's a very, you see this in anime too. I love it. Um, and a lot of good storytelling will do this where you get within the narrative, you will get that stream of conscious. Um, and it offers a very unique perspective. So we kind of get Anne during the day and then Anne within her diary. So you get kind of that dualism going on a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and read that section. Let me talk about it. <clears throat> Mr. Frank's directive. As he starts towards the sink, the carillon begins to chime the hour of eight. He tiptoes to the window at the back and looks down at the street below. He turns to Peter, indicating in pantomime that it is too late. Peter starts back for his room. He steps on a creaking board. The three of them are frozen for a minute in fear. As Peter starts away again, Anne tiptoes over to him and pours some of the milk from her glass into the saucer for the cat. Peter squats on the floor, putting the milk before the cat. Mr. Frank gives Anne his fountain pen and then goes into the room at the right. For a second, Anne watches the cat, then goes over to the center table and opens her diary. In the room at the right, Mrs. Frank has sat up quickly at the sound of the carillon. Mr. Frank comes in and sits down beside her on the settee, his arm comforting her, comfortingly around her. Upstairs in the attic room, Mr. and Mrs. Van Den have hung their clothes in the closet and are now seated on the iron bed. Mrs. Van Den leads back exhausted. Mr. Van Den fans her with the newspaper. Anne starts to write in her diary. The light. Lights dim out. The curtain falls. In the darkness, Anne's voice comes to us again, faintly at first and then with growing strength. And that's been a repeated directive. And within the last time it was vain at first and then with growing strength. It's interesting. It's like the process of which someone gains the courage, like comfortability within writing. They're getting it all out. So let's see what she says. Anne's voice. I expect I should be describing what it feels like to go into hiding. But I really don't know yet myself. I only know it's funny never to be able to go outdoors never to breathe fresh air, never to run and shout and jump. It's the silence in the nights that frighten me most. 
Every time I hear a creak in the house or step on the street outside, I sure they're, they're coming for us. The days aren't so bad. At least we know that Meep and Mr. Crayler are down there below us in the office. Our protectors, we call them. I asked Father what would happen to them if the Nazis found out they were hiding us. Pim said that they would suffer the same fate that we would. Imagine! They know this, and yet they come up here. They are always cheerful and gay, as if there was nothing in the world to bother them. Friday, the 21st of August, 1942. Today, I'm going to tell you our general news. Mother is unbearable. She insists on treating me like a baby, which I loathe. Otherwise, things are going better. The weather is... So, there's much discussion, and I have not done a lot of research yet. I'm sure there's much on Anne, the person. And she has kind of that playful, childlike dialogue. Um, and we see that again where she is switching subjects and we got the dot 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 again. I have, especially in these parts where she is talking about those tough subjects, I see it as kind of her just, it's getting her impassioned or riled up again. <laughs> and so we see that a bit when she's talking about how these people, Mr. Crayler and Meep, who are the Dutch, that are hiding them in the annex behind the bookshelf. If they would suffer the same fate, we would. Because they know that death was the fate of anybody who was found by the Nazis. Um, imagine. So she kind of calls upon the audience, too. And there's that intimacy that can be found within the theater. Um, but of particular interest to me, I love how she starts it. She starts it, I expect I should be describing what it feels like to go into hiding. So she almost breaks that, the third wall a little bit, right? She's kind of like record scratch. I expect this is what you're supposed to be hearing right now, is me complaining about what, you know, how this feels like. But there is no way to articulate it to you. <laughs> kind of way. And it's one of those beautiful little, again, pieces of dark humor that you can get uh, from a 13-year-old. And I particularly love Anne's character in general. She's portrayed very much as the annoying 13-year-old. But to me, she is kind of like the audience's lens, if you will, or kind of their keyhole into the reality of what they're doing. Like, look at how ridiculous it is. These people are fighting this is going on, that is going on, and nobody's trying to, bah, like, so it's very much like if Anne was you shaking the TV, like, stop, <laughs> and it's um, a very unique perspective, the mind of a 13-year-old, for sure, so we get that in her dialogue yet again. <laughs> the uh, pieces that are again beautiful of course within the hauntedness is the descriptions of the creaking boards the night time the uh, steps on the street so paying attention to sounds yet again and if i were to go so far as to claim if one is in hiding one is always hyper aware of sounds so it definitely puts you in that mind of just the slightest, just, I, I mean, one can only imagine, right? She says it right there in her uh, stream of conscious. So she's trying to articulate to the audience what this feels like. And to a degree, she, it's, it's difficult. She almost goes into this uh, robotic, like, oh, is this what one might expect? The weather's fair. This is the date, right? Like how we talked about at the beginning, like this is what one might write in their diary. And she says that. So it's very, um, again, we get that playful perspective. Um, the director's piece, which is also of particular uh, eloquence, piece of writing, I, I might add, even that is gorgeous. 
um, has a mention of the Carillon, which is the bell tower. And again, we get that reference to a musical sound, that instrument. Um, and I'm sure there's also historical relevance on when it would chime at certain times. Um, I'm guessing from the directors, director's directive uh, that when it struck at the time of six, I believe, chime, an hour of eight. So that was, all right, that's the directive to the audience as well. It's getting late and nothing necessarily ever good happens after nighttime. And this is like where we end scene two, uh, scene two. So, and I think it's very fitting. It's almost got like an Edgar Allan Poe type of vibe where we get the haunting bell, it's nighttime, we've gone into hiding, and now we're gonna open up with the dualism of Anne with this is what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is the reality that sometimes gets distorted or the pieces that we don't necessarily always get to hear. So, um, also fun side fact, I have read and progressed. I've read all of act one. And so I know who Dussel was. And so in regards to the previous video, he turns out is a guy that joins their party <laughs> I may say, use that terminology from the Oregon Trail game. Uh, he joins their party. He's a dentist. He's a lone wolf. He's just, you know, he just got picked up along the way type of thing. And he has just kind of been a lone wolf for a while. And so when he joins, he has to bunk with Anne. And so there's a lot of clashes. And so when they're both closing the doors on them they were both just at that point like we're we don't want to talk to you we're irritated with you <laughs> um and to a certain degree i mean i don't blame them he is kind of just very sour pussy sometimes um so that's a little bit on dussel but he's not like a scary creepy scooby-doo villain type of character as i was like envisioning so that was kind of a fun way to have that preview and then go back um so that would be an interesting way to do it you think about the activity of like first chapter fridays or something and then a kid would obviously pick up the book and have to pick up from that point from which you had read and maybe the first chapter of the book but it'd be kind of interesting just to, all right, kids. Oh, we're reading this page today. This is the first one I flipped to and then have to start from the beginning. So. I, again, continue to love this. I remember when I was studying at Asian Lit and we read a lot of plays. And the cool thing about that is the way that scripts are written, they always have a fun way of articulating, uh, like, figurative language, literary devices, and just embodying it so well. And I can't wait to read more. <laughs>